Proverbs chapter number 15. Begin reading verse number 8. The Bible says, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he loveth him that follow after righteousness. Correction is grievous unto him that f forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. Hell and destruction are before the Lord, how much more than the hearts of the children of men. Now, you heard our pastor say it not too long ago. Book of Proverbs, sometimes you can find a couple of verses that will chain together and have a coherent thought. Other times it will change verse to verse. Sometimes it might change halfway through the verse. But, in chapter number 15, the book of Proverbs, we find first two things that the Bible refers to as an abomination unto the Lord. You've heard me say this many times. Abomination does not mean like the abominable snowman. We think, you know, like, oh, it's a scary thing, right? It's something that hides up in the mountain, spooky monsters. That's not what abomination means. Abomination means that it's something that God hates and a God eventually one day will wipe off the face of the earth and wipe out of existence forevermore. Right? The Bible, in very few instances, will tell you, and Proverbs is another one, where it lists seven things that God hates. Right? We know that God is a God of love. We like hearing about that. We like hearing that God offers forgiveness. We like hearing that God's long-suffering, that He's merciful, that He's faithful to do all that He's promised to do. But at the same time, God, for a space of grace, we are in the dispensation of grace, through His grace, He doesn't wipe off the things that He hates because He wants to give man an opportunity to come to repentance. But it doesn't mean that God hates him any less. God's hate is not a hate that is born out of malice or born out of a preference towards one thing or another. Man's hates are built off of what we feel. Right? God does have emotions. He is love, the Bible tells us. It's just a part of who he is. But just as much as love is a part of God, so is God's hate for things that are unrighteous. God does not hate something because of who that person is, where that person came from, what they were born into. God hates that thing, these two things in particular, and they are abominations unto because they are unholy, because they are unrighteous. Well, the first one that it mentions, verse number 8, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. Then the contrast, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Now in this verse, we can go all the way back to Cain and Abel. And you find the same mentality of the flesh versus the mentality of the spirit. In the flesh, the wicked offers up what? A sacrifice. And it's a sacrifice of the wicked. The wicked is not making sacrifice to atone. They are making a sacrifice of what they have done. What did Cain bring and put on the altar to burn unto God? He brought fruit of the field. Fruit of his labor. Because Abel was the one that kept the flock. Cain thought that the works of his hands were just as beautiful in the eyes of God as the work of Abel's hand, as the shepherd. But it wasn't about the labor... And it wasn't about how much effort you put into it. It was about obedience. Right? It says, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. You know what prayer entails? First, prayer conveys a relationship. By definition, the word prayer just means to speak to God. Right? Then the Bible gets very specific on different kinds of prayer. Right? There's supplication, intercession, giving of thanks. Right? There's fasting, and you can fast in a, a mindset and in a spirit of prayer where all you're saying is, Lord, I'm making myself available listening for what you want to speak unto me. Show you how serious I am about waiting on you and expecting an answer from you. But see, we don't see God with our eyes. We know that we're blinded by sin, that the veil's been put over our eyes. Adam could look up into heaven and see angels ascending, descending. He could see everything going on in heaven just as if 
It was going on here on earth before sin came. Right? Well, how close is heaven? Well, it's close enough that when the Lord says, go get the church, we're going to hear a shout, right, a trump, as a shout of a voice of an archangel. Well, how close is it? It was close enough that Stephen, when he was being stoned, could look up and see Jesus standing to receive him. Heaven's not as far away as everybody thinks it is. It's just that there's a veil between us and there. One of these days, the Bible says that in the days of tribulation, God's going to roll back the sky. How close is heaven? It's going to be close enough that everybody can see him all at once. Because the Bible says that everyone is going to run to the hills, crying to the rocks to fall upon them, so they don't have to look at the face of an almighty and holy God. Heaven's a lot closer than we think it is, but we can't see it. I hear his voice through the Spirit, speaking with my spirit. I mean, the verse does say that his Spirit bears witness with our spirit, that we are the sons of God. His Spirit, his spirit bears witness with you a whole lot more than that, too. We know that the Word is spiritually discerned. You know the difference between you reading the words of the Bible in your head to yourself, and you know the difference when the Spirit starts talking to you about them words. I can't audibly hear him. Can't visually see him. Can't reach out and touch him, but he makes me feel a whole lot. When I'm wrong, he makes me feel conviction. When I'm right, he makes me feel praise. He makes me feel accepted among the brethren. He makes me feel the love of God. He makes me feel love for others. There's a whole lot that he can make me feel, even though I can't reach out and grab him touch him well what are you saying brother Jordan the prayer of the upright is the manifestation of his faith you don't pray if you don't think anybody's listening the prayer of the upright okay that's the for lack of a better term groanings and utterings the things that you and I don't know what everybody else is praying to God only you know what's said between you and God. But those are your most precious, your most sincere, the things that you would love to see God move on the behalf of the most. And you know I can't do it. You know the world can't do it. But you know that God is able. So you cast your cares upon Him, believing that one, He can bear it, but two, that He's going to do something about it. If you believe that, you live different. The prayer of the righteous the prayer of the believer one who asks in faith nothing wavering fully committed to believing that one God is able and God will do it if you pray like that you live a life of faith you don't just believe that God can you believe God will so you live as if God will do it when he says that the prayer of the upright is his delight you're going to go out and you're going to labor like you're expecting a bounty like you're expecting a harvest if you pray Lord let the, let the crops in the field grow if you believe he's going to do it you're going to have harvesting equipment you're not going to wait around not preparing for the bounty right there's a difference between asking and believing I can ask for anything. Some things I know God isn't going to give me. Why? Because He said that He wouldn't. Because they would be me consuming them upon my own lust. Right? They would only serve self. They would not serve the purpose of God. But there are other things that God said, you ask, but you don't receive. Why? Because you don't believe. God is a rewarder of the faithful. The faithful are those that put their trust in God and keep their trust in God. That's all faithful means. They're full of faith. If you're full of faith, you believe that God will. So you live as if God's going to do it and you're going to get prepared for it. Why do you think that the prayer of the upright is his delight? Because when someone puts their faith in something they can't see, something they can't hear, something that they can't physically touch, and they live their life to prove that what they say they believe is what they actually believe. 
It is the delight of the Father for His children to be obedient. The Father does not enjoy chastising His children, but it's His delight. Right? It is the crown on top of His head, so to speak. It's His joy that His children walk in obedience and faithfulness. Why do you think Jesus was altogether lovely? Because everything He did was in perfect obedience and in the perfect will of God. Why did the Father love the Son so much? Because the Son just lived to please the Father. But when you ask in faith, what you're saying is, Lord, I believe Jesus was who He said He was. I believe that You're all-powerful, almighty, that You can do all things. You don't need me, but for some odd reason, You chose to use me. So I'm going to go out and prepare like You're going to do it and tell everybody around me to be preparing for it. You say, Brother Jordan, that sounds crazy. I thought Noah was crazy too, but he was still building a boat and tell people that it was going to rain. What was Noah's prayer? Lord, let me build the ark, and Lord, let it rain. And what did he do? He lived like it was going to happen. Because if Noah didn't build the ark, none of us would be here. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? The prayer of the upright is a whole lot more than just their prayer. Their prayer shows their faith, but their faith shows how they live. Well, how does the wicked live? The sacrifice of the wicked, they go out to make as much as they can with what they have and they expect God to be pleased with it. Instead of using faith, they rely upon the carnal man. Now, carnality makes a whole lot of sense to the flesh because it cut from the same cloth. What is that cloth? Sin. Everything that you do through the arm of the flesh without direction from God, without discerning what God would have you to do, or without faith that God's going to do what you cannot do. But when you go out and you go to do something in the flesh, you're rejecting everything that God said was right. Because God said not to lean on your own understanding. God said, trust in the Lord, thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. When you lean on your own understanding, you're rejecting God's wisdom and substituting your own. To go out and to labor into what you think is valuable is to reject the kingdom of heaven. You're not interested in laying up gold and silver and precious gems. You want wood, hand, stubble for down here. Can you understand now why the sacrifice? They put a whole lot of effort into it. Right? There's a lot of singing groups. They practice until they can't sing no more. They get up and they sound like the world would think. They sound like angels. But why isn't God anywhere near it? Because they're doing it all through the arm of flesh. The person that gets up and sings something to sound pretty, that's the sacrifice of the wicked. God's got all the music that he could ever want. In fact, the devil thought that music was so important, he was the angel of music in heaven. Lucifer. And he saw how much music delighted the Lord, and all of a sudden he starts thinking, well, if God likes me so much, maybe I should be in charge. Music's got a lot of power in it, if God's in it. But if God isn't in it, you can get a different person substituted in there. It's got a different spirit about that music, and it's still got power to it. It's not the music that makes the difference. Instead of being focused on hitting every note right, how about you just think about the words that you're singing and open up your heart and sing from there towards God. And I promise you one thing, He'll listen. God inhabits the praise of His people. God doesn't inhabit the performance of His people. There's a whole lot of people that'll study and get up and teach or preach. Why? Because they want people in the audience to tell them how good they did the sacrifice of the wicked Christ never spoke of himself who did he speak of the father he was an ambassador from heaven to come and show man what it is that they needed and how God had already provided it then he became the sacrifice that they needed so that he could perform the work of redeeming them like the father had preordained before the foundation of the world he became our high priest a priest is a servant. 
Well, I thought he's the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He is. And one day everybody's going to admit that. But right now, he's seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you. Right now, it's the will of the Father that Christ is a servant for you. The work of the faithful, the prayer of the upright, they become a servant for Jesus. Are we not to be conformed to the image of His Son? If His Son has been, for the time being, translated into a servant for the sons and the children of God, should not we become a servant towards others? But everything about the flesh and everything about the sacrifice of the wicked is to show how great they are. I couldn't care what you think about me. Now some of y'all are dear to me, and if I found out that y'all thought ill of me, it may wound me in the flesh. But in truth, there's only one person's opinion I care about, that's God's. I got that way a long time ago. You know why? Because I saw so many people getting hurt in church over stupid stuff. It didn't matter. Wasn't worth a plug nickel. Seen so many churches that used to be open, now they're closed. Why? Because of stupid stuff. In truth, I don't care if y'all showed up today or not. I was teaching. If it's just me and Brother Randy, he'd have turned the speakers up real loud because you don't know he's going deaf. Yeah, Sam, I'm kidding. But if it's just us two, I'd have taught. may not have been as loud, but I'd have taught. Why? Because I don't care what you think. My labor is not a sacrifice of myself. I may give of myself, may give of my time, but it's not a sacrifice for me, it's a sacrifice for him. The wicked think they need to give you something to get something in return. I already have everything because of what Christ gave me. I have nothing more to gain. What do I have? It all. I'm a joint heir with him. I'm not giving of myself to get something from you. He gave me everything I needed. But the wicked believe if I give of myself, God will give me something in return. God promised that he'd give you everything that belonged to Jesus, according to his word. So if you desire something, he promised you to meet your needs. So what are you trying to get? If he gave you everything you needed, and more, let's be honest, why do you give of yourself expecting something from God? in return for it. This is not a trade equation. He gave everything and he got you. That was a losing deal. He got me. Bad trade. But why did he do it? Because he loved you and he knew what you would become in his son, which is perfect. And he thought that was worth the trade. I have it all. But the wicked think that they need something else. You know what? That is the mentality of the flesh, the old man. The flesh always wants more, something new. Well, I find that what is true is that if you get him, you really get a hold of him, you have a relationship with him, you'll find there's nothing else you need or nothing else you want because you are satisfied in him. But the wicked want to come in and lay down what it is that they've done for God they haven't done a thing hadn't been one person holy enough since Jesus came or before Jesus came that they were able to make their own oxygen for a half a second or keep this world spinning on its course for a fraction of a second that they were able to make the sun shine before the sun existed because he said let there be light before the sun was there but he's saying, Brother Jordan, you haven't done a thing for God. God has used you to do something for himself. And when you yield to that, he can use you to do great and mighty things. But the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord. But what's the next abomination? It says the way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord. Now the way, we know that there's a way called straight. It's narrow. There's few there be that find it. But we also know that there's a way that's broad and leadeth to destruction. 
what is that way that way is a path that only thinks about itself from the moment that God was when was that way back in the alpha time he is because he is when did he start he never he don't think about start he just is he says I am that I am God's always here now and he promises that in our time frame he's the same yesterday today and forever but in God's time frame it's always now when he sees you seated in heavenly places he sees you seated there now in God's eyes that's why you're robed in his righteousness because he already knows you're going to be there your conversation he's already talking to you there it's recorded he knows what you're going to say we just got to wait and get there and figure out what he's going to say to us but see the way of the wicked is consumed with self but since God ever was because he is God has one known you and two loved you God is God he's all holy it's all righteous he's perfect he doesn't need, doesn't need us but he desired to have fellowship with his creation so what did he do he created it and when he knew that he would create Adam he knew you'd be coming along and he loved you and he desired to have conversation with you to have fellowship with you to have time with you not because you're forced to but because you chose to the way of the wicked rejects all of that and focuses on self God's always been concerned with others the way of the wicked is only concerned with self the way of the wicked will put you in a bottle to where you become insulated from everything around you God promised that when he saved us that we were called out of the world but we're still in the world he commanded us to go to the world the way of the wicked is one that will draw you away from others it will isolate you if you're isolated you can't make an impact if you're isolated you become ostracized from those around you God never intended man to be away from other man God intended man to be with God you know what caused separation? sin you know what the way of the wicked will do? it'll cause separation distancing we are to separate ourselves from the world why? because we're not a part of it but even sin will cause people that are in sin to separate why do you think racism right? nationalism all these different divisions of how we can separate people gender studies you know what all that's about? separating people into different groups so that they can identify with this group and this one can and then they're going to lash out against each other it's a story of man since sin came into the world but if you become separated isolated then you're a prime target for hunting season if you're by yourself there's nobody to give you a warning that something's coming if you've cut off the Holy Ghost in your life there's not going to be any red flags because you've grieved them keep them from speaking to you you continue down that way called pride full of self eventually you're going to run across a snare that God allowed the devil to put in your way because you can turn around and in hindsight there were a whole lot of places to pull a U-turn repent and get back to God but you were purposed upon walking into that trap knowing that it was going to be out there because you knew that God chastens his own knowing that he delivered Peter over to the devil because the devil desired to sift him as wheat knowing that if he allowed that to happen to Peter right, who presumably at that point was in his will right, how much more will he allow to happen to prove to you that you're wrong to get you to return to the father's house you know it's out there but yet you keep walking boldly into it because once you're isolated then you can become dominated once 
you've been dominated you can be intimidated by the world eventually you get back to the point where you're in subjection to the world those chains that Christ broke when he saved you you allow the world to put them back on you and if you weren't strong enough to break them back then what makes you think you're strong enough to get out of them now there's only one thing that can deliver you from that way called isolation called independence you know what all of it is it's different words but they all boil down to this it's the way of self and you will get yourself into a whole lot of problems on your own don't take nobody else's help but if you allow the world to put them chains back on you there's only one way to get them back out it's for the Lord to deliver you from it am I saying that you're lost that you're not going to go to heaven nope you're still saved you just went back to the jail cell that you used to be in and locked the door again the Lord brought you out of it but you went back to it is it any wonder that the way of the wicked is an abomination unto him it should be enough that for him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin that means that you know what's right in order to go down the road that's called wicked Okay, well, let's look at the other way. But he that loveth, but he loveth them that followeth after righteousness. In order to embrace righteousness, you have to deny yourself, because you understand that all your righteousness is as filthy rags. To pursue after the way of righteousness, you have to learn to control those urges and impulses of the flesh that want to go back out into the world and wallow in the things that it used to wallow in you've got to learn to bridle the body you've got to learn to control that wicked thing called a tongue keep it from saying them wicked things that come out of your heart in order to follow after righteousness you've got to trust in somebody else to guide you I do not know what righteousness is I only know that Christ told us he was righteous and he told us to follow after him he said be ye holy you know how you get there following after him ask anybody in here say give me a road map to being holy I don't know what it is for you I just know what he's told me and I don't know how we're going to get the rest of the way there because I'm just following after him day by day I can tell you how I got to here but I can't tell you what the finish plan is and we know there's some things that apply to everybody don't lie don't cheat don't steal don't kill people right that's not called being holy that's just called being what God expects every person to be holy is to stop being you and let Christ live through you if I can't figure that out for me what makes you think I can figure it out for you now, there's a lot of numbskulls out there that think they can tell you what God wants from your life if anybody ever tells you that this is God's will for your life and then just ignore it unless he's got chapter and verse to say this applies to everybody that guy's a quack just like Dr. Phil anyway not our Dr. Phil the real Dr. Phil he don't even have a medical degree but yet they call him doctor anyway or I mean he's got a PhD but he didn't get that until after he started the TV shows what are you saying brother Jordan I'm saying there's a lot of people that will look at you and tell you what you need to do. The way of righteousness is to stop looking at you and to look at him. Anybody that wants to get your eyes on who you are or where you're at or what it is that you're doing, they're looking the wrong direction. I find everything that I need to be and I find everything that I need in order to get there in him. The reason that the Lord loveth the one that walks after righteousness is because in order to take that first step Jesus has got to save you but to take every step after that you're conforming more into the image of his son you're leaving self by the wayside you're saying Lord we don't need this anymore Lord in order to get there I got to let go of this so let's stop so I can unattach it or Lord this chain I can't break this one but you said that if I follow after you if the sun sets you free it's free indeed Lord I, I got myself hooked again can you break this chain Lord I stepped in another trap 
That's why they're called traps, by the way, because they trap you. They wouldn't be called traps. They'd be called failures. But Lord, I'm in another trap. You know what that means? You can't get out. He's got to come loose it. He loves those that walk after righteousness because it's somebody that every step of the way is letting go of more of what they used to be and embracing what God wants to turn them into. You don't get there first without loving Him completely. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Because a man cannot have two masters. He'll love one and hate the other. Guess who you're going to conform to the image of? The one that you love more. Because you want to be like those that you love. You want to have fellowship with the ones that you love. And you know that you can't walk into the White House. Well, nowadays you might be able to, but used to. You couldn't walk into the White House looking like a bum. Nowadays they might let that fly. Used to, if it meant black tie only, there was a bouncer at the door, and if you weren't dressed right, he wasn't going to let you into the dinner. You had to conform to the expectations. Well, guess what the world expects you to look like? The world. Guess what God expects you to look like? His son. And every step of the way to looking more like his son, you're not looking at you. Because when I look in here, all I see is what he wants me to let go of things that I'm holding on to, things that are hindrances unto me. May not be wicked, may not be sinful, but it's something that's keeping me from being what God expects me to be. And if I love Him supremely, I'll let it go. Because the only thing I desire is His hand in mine. Walking each step of the way to become more what He expects me to be. Is it any wonder that God would love that person? Why? Because they love Him. They love His Son. They love His way, which is righteous. They love everything about God. You know what that tells me? They're obedient. And we circle back to, again, faith is what? Trust in what God said. Walking down the way of righteousness is yielding to what God wants you to live. Both of them are rejecting self and embracing something that you've never seen before. They are ways of faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please Him. So those that are all together full of faith, no wonder He's pleased with them. No wonder He shows out love towards them. But anything that rejects faith or tries to substitute something else in the place of faith, God finds is an abomination. Because all He asked you to do was trust that He was enough. And when you don't, what you're saying is, I don't believe God's enough. And by definition, that's blasphemy. Because God is everything. God's well able to do anything for you. And to say that I don't believe God is to deny that God is who He is. No wonder that's an abomination in the eyes of God. It'd be the same as standing up in a church and proclaiming that I don't believe that Christ is any you know, was the Son of God. That is just as blasphemous as saying, I don't believe God. I don't believe God can do what He said He could do. You're saying that God's not God, which is what the world says when they say Jesus Christ is just a prophet, just a good man, just a leader, a social movement. We look at that and say, well, that's awful. That's, I hate that. Well, that's what God thinks about the way of the wicked. It's what God thinks about the sacrifice of the wicked. Because both of them say God wasn't enough, so I put my sprinkles on top. God's not pleased with you. God's pleased with His Son. Both of those things that He finds delight in, that He loves those that walk in those things, guess what they are? They're conforming more to the image of His Son. Well, verse number 10 says, Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way. Then there's a colon. That means that's one thought, then the next part's another thought. But really, there's two thoughts in the first part of that verse. Someone that's forsaken the way, okay, some people would call that a traitor, right? The military, if you give up arms against them, you go AWOL, that means you're a traitor. You're a deserter. You left people behind that were dependent on you. 
way back in the day if you deserted and they could prove it they didn't have to go to court they just shoot you right then and there because you weren't worth keeping around they couldn't trust you no more it's a crime to leave those that are dependent upon you in the military behind in order to run away from danger at best you're going to end up in a place called Leavenworth you don't want to go there the court martial you they'll take away all of the you know decoration whether you had medals or any they will void all the good that you ever did turning your back on those that were dependent upon you leaving them behind while trying to get to safety or trying to get away from danger you may not even be trying I just don't want to be there that's too dangerous that's a crime in the eyes of man Imagine how much more in the eyes of God for someone that knows the truth to turn and turn back to what they know is a lie for a temporary pleasure. We know that there's pleasure in sin, but only for a season. Knowing that it isn't going to last, knowing that it didn't satisfy them before, knowing that everything in their spirit is crying out against what they're getting ready to do, they boldly walk back into it for a little bit of pleasure for a season knowing all the damage and destruction it can do, still they walk into it. That's somebody that is forsaken the way. And it says correction is grievous unto them. We've talked about that word grieve before. What it literally means, it feels like you're being pulled apart in every which direction that you can be pulled in. It makes you feel like you can't go one more step without coming undone. So when it says that he was grieved, he was wounded for our transgressions, gives a little bit more insight into what Christ went through in order to pay your sin debt. But somebody that's forsaken the ways of God, turn their back on them, they've known them, they've rejected them, they've gone back into what they know to be one, a lie, but two, won't sustain them. Correction is grievous unto them. Why? Because their spirit's pulling them in one direction, their flesh is pulling them in the other direction, and they feel like they're about ready to pop. They feel like if they take one more step, they're just going to come undone at the seams. Well, correction is grievous to them. So what do they do? They avoid correction. Somebody that knows they're wrong, you're not going to find them anywhere where they're going to hear about what's right. If they have forsaken the way, long before that, they have forsaken the house of God, the people of God, the things of God. Why? Because they all correct them and tell them to get back to the Father's house. But because it is so grievous to them, they will bury themselves further in sin than what they were originally, just to avoid hearing the name Jesus hearing about the Bible, hearing anything that has spiritual connotation to it. Why? Because every word of it reminds them you're not where you're supposed to be, and it's grievous unto them. You say, well, how, how could that person end up, you know, in the eyes of the world, how could they end up worse off after they left the things of God? Because they're trying to run so far away that they don't even hear an echo of the name Jesus. Or hear an echo of about the things that they used to love or that they know is where they're supposed to be at. They literally will drive themselves nuts just to avoid being corrected. Why? Because it pulls at the things that nobody else can see. It causes them so much pain and turmoil to know that they're wrong and be reminded that they're wrong that they'd rather suffer in misery out there than admit that they were wrong. So what do they do? They avoid correction. But on the opposite of that, right? those that have forsaken the way correction is grievous to, but those that are still in the way, correction is cherished. If you love the way that you're walking on, you want to stay on that path. It's no problem when you're doing something that you love, doing it with people that you love doing it for someone who altogether loved you with an everlasting love and you unreservedly love him back. 
it is not an inconvenience for him to say, hey, your shoe's untied. Thank you, Lord. That could have caused me to trip. Hey, watch out. There's a pothole up ahead. You've only walked into like the last four of them. All right, Lord, I promise I'm going to be on the lookout for it. I may still trip. I may still fall into it, but Lord, thank you for warning me. If I fall in it, I'm going to ask you to help me get out of it. Correction is not a problem when you know it's for your betterment and when you believe that you're where you're supposed to be. If God reveals unto you that you're not where you're supposed to be, thank you, Lord, I need to get where I'm supposed to be. Why? Because all that you care about is staying right next to Him on that path. Because again, in order to forsake, what do you have to let go of? Your faithfulness. But if you are faithful, you want to stay as close to Him as you can be. And if God reveals something to you through correction, you were wrong. You're right, Lord, I was wrong. Yeah, of course He's right. He's God. He's never been wrong. But Lord, thank you for showing... It's not grievous. Right? You're grateful for it. Because you know that God pointed it out because you're not as close as you used to be or you should be. And that's what it's going to take. That needs to be addressed in order to get closer. Right? If somebody on your job walked up and said, hey, the reason you didn't get promoted was because of this. Well, thanks for telling me that. Next, I'll get that fixed so next time I get promoted. Why would you get angry at that person? They're trying to help you. Well, all God's trying to do is help you. We're thankful for the things that remove impediments and remove obstacles and remove those thorns in the flesh that we put there ourselves. Why? Because they allow us to become more like Him. But it also says, He that hateth reproof. You know what reproof is? Reproof is confrontation that you are wrong. It's one thing to know you're wrong, but every now and then God will reprove you. That means even though you know you're wrong, God's going to come out and say, all right, it's time for you to make a decision. Here's what's right, and you know what's wrong. God may send a preacher along the way. God may give a verse that you just can't get away from, can't run from, can't sleep and get away from it. All to what? He's making you confront that you're wrong. Well, people that hate coming to terms with the fact that they're not perfect, they're not good Christians. Because they put themselves up on top of ivory pillars, looking down at everybody else, and yet, what are they holding on to? Themselves. But those that embrace reproof, Lord, you're right, I'm sorry. Because reproof will either bring rebellion or it will bring repentance. When God brings you to the crossroad and says, today's decision day. Either get right or get gone. You've either rebelled against God and rejected Him, or you have to repent in order to go back to where you were supposed to be. There's only those two options. There's no, can I call a friend? Can we poll the audience? Can I get a 50-50? You are already down to two choices. It's either get right, or you've got to get away from God. What does God think of rebellion? Well, it's as the sin of witchcraft. Why? Because you believe in yourself over what you know to be true in God. We're back to, again, blasphemy. But then, verse number 11, it says, Hell and destruction are before the Lord. You know what that means? God can see into the very pit of hell. And when it says destruction, just because it's been destroyed off the face of the earth doesn't mean that God still doesn't see it. We can't find Sodom and Gomorrah today. You know what? God can look into the pit of destruction and He still sees what it was when He destroyed it. Those things that even God has wiped off the face of the earth, they're still before God. You can't hide them. That's what it's saying. You can throw it off into hell, but guess what? God can still see it right there where it is at. You could cast yourself into the very lake of fire, and guess what? God's still going to know. He's still going to be able to see you. 
what he's saying, Brother Jordan? Well, the verse is saying, if God can see all that, how much more than the hearts of the children of men? You can't hide anything from God even in the darkest circle of hell. How do you think Jesus walked in and took the keys to death and or yeah, death and hell? He walked right into where the devil was and says, Hey, keys. And he said, Yes, Lord. Part of me really thinks that the devil thought that he had gotten away from the sight of God. I'm going to go hide away. Walking to and fro, up and down in the earth, seeking whom he can devour. When God needed to get a hold of him, guess where God found him? Right where he was. And it caught the devil off guard. Because they thought they'd killed Christ on the cross. And he knocked on the door. In my version of events, I'd like to see him kick the door. But considering that he's about, you know, he just bought the door, he probably didn't want to break it. What was that door? The door to let people out of hell. But he walked right in, caught the devil off guard, didn't catch God off guard. Everything's before him. Can't hide anything from him. So if we believe that that's true, why on earth would we think that we can hide something from God? Our heart's deceitfully wicked. God knows every single thing that's in it. Those things that you don't even know, God already knows. You're not going to catch Him off guard. You're not going to disappoint God by saying, Lord, I found this in my heart. He's going to say, I knew it was there, just waiting for you to repent of it. I was waiting for you to come to me and ask me to help you with it. But instead, you kept it and tried to hide it, and it became too much for you to handle. And it caused a whole lot of hurt and a whole lot of pain. It caused rebuke and reproof and correction. But because I love you, I sent those things that way so that you'd come back so I could help you with it. You think you can hide it away and think that you can wrestle it into submission. If you were big enough to wrestle all the wickedness in your own heart, that means you'd been more powerful than sin. Which means you'd been able to set yourself free of sin. Don't know where the mentality came along that Christians are supposed to be able to handle all the problems in their life. That's not what the Bible, Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that Jesus is enough to handle all the problems in your life. The Bible teaches that we're supposed to fully in faith believe and trust on Him. It doesn't say that you're enough. In fact, it says the arm of flesh is going to fail you. But spiritually, that arm of the Lord can do all things. In fact, most of the time in order for God to do it, you've got to get out of the way. Because the thing that prevents God from doing is man's will. So you've got to get out of the way so that God can get in front of you, in between you and your problem. It's not going to catch God off guard. He already knows. And because He knows, that means He's already made provisions to take care of it for you. But what do you have to do? You've got to let go of self. You've got to let go of pride. Say, Lord... I wasn't as much as I thought I was. He says, it's all right. One of these days, you're going to be just like my son. One of these days, you will be. In the meantime, put on his wardrobe so that you look like him, so that you smell like him. Right? Go listen to him so that when you go out in the world, you sound like him. Ask him what he sees when he looks at people so that when you see him, you see like he sees. You don't see where they're at. You see the need. You look past what they are and you see what God wants to do with them and the impact that God wants to make in their life. You're never going to do that if you're holding on to self. Never going to do that if you're firmly fixed your eyes in a mirror. But that kind of mentality will drive you nuts. You think I'm kidding. Why do you think there's so many people medicated today for things that didn't exist 40 years ago? Because everybody's looking at themselves and they don't like what they see. And they've tried everything that they can to change themselves and they can't and they're losing it. Literally. Because their brain can't handle the idea that they can't change who they are, what they are, where they're at. 
That's all the mentality of the world. You can't change a thing about yourself. In olden days, they would say, by the grace of God, we were able to do this or that. They knew they didn't do it. Go read the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution. They understood we didn't do this. God allowed it to happen, and we're going to be thankful for it. And to show our thanks, we're going to frame this country not based off of what we want, but off of what God expects. Did they get it all right? No, but it's a whole lot better than what it was. And it's gotten better since then. Why? Because they allowed these things called amendments to happen. Has it ever been perfect? No. Nope. But you know why God blessed it? Because people were thankful for what God gave them. Now they reject all of it, and they are only interested in what they can turn themselves into. God ain't going to bless that. You can turn yourself into a mess, but that's it. You can turn yourself more into the image of the world and the image of the devil, but you can't do a thing for yourself. You may be able to go out and labor, but it's not going to be blessed unless God blesses it. Even in olden times, they knew if God let a wicked king come and sit on the throne, there's a reason for it. So until God allows us to either do something about it, we're going to thank God for the king that we have because he's doing something towards God's will, towards his design. They respected those in positions of authority. Why? Because they knew God allowed it to happen. They rejected self and instead embraced what God wanted. Those are the people that are blessed. Those are the people that are content. They're the ones that have joy in their life because they're not interested in them. They're interested in Him. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.